Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Just give everyone an opportunity to, to enter. I think that's everyone in now. Great. Um, so welcome everybody to this evening's webinar. It's our second to last webinar before we break for the Christmas. Um, my name is Michelle and the title of this evening's webinar is AI Horizons, an overview of AI and its potential to enhance pharmacy practice. So a really interesting and intriguing topic um, and looking forward to hearing more of what Frank has to tell us about that. Um, so just before we introduce Frank officially, um, we want to go through some of the domestics, um, which you'll be mostly be familiar with. And um, this webinar is being recorded just for your own information. Um, and the recording will be made available afterwards if there are any colleagues who couldn't make it this evening and would like to watch it back. Um, microphones, just if you could keep them muted, please, just to ensure the sound quality throughout. Your videos, you're very welcome to keep them on if you wish. It's lovely to see some faces looking back at us. Um, However, if you are experiencing problems with connectivity, feel free to turn it off and that should help with the situation. Similarly, if you're having difficulty with your sound, try the, something first like checking is it muted or turned down on your computer or phone in those settings. And then failing that, you can try logging off and on again. Um, I had to do that myself here now this evening and it tends to work. Um, you can use the chat box throughout. We really welcome any questions or comments during the presentation and what we'll do is we'll have a Q&A session at the end and we'll compile those and maybe there might be some similar questions coming through so we'll group those together where we can um, and just for your own information we may be using some anonymized information from this webinar going forward. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Frank. Um, Frank is the IIOP's learning technologist and looks after the online systems at the Institute. Um, he, this includes the learning management system or the My Courses part of the website that we would all be familiar with, the ePortfolio system, um, and that includes the ePortfolio review process and um, all things training related. Frank is the person to go to on that. Frank is an online learning instructional designer, a software developer and software tester. So Frank is very well placed to deliver this webinar for us this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Frank. Oh, thank you, Michelle. I'm just going to share my screen now. Okay, you seeing that okay? It's presenter mode, Frank. Oh, okay. Try that again. It's always a glitch somewhere. Okay. Where's that one? Still presenter mode. Ah. Okay, I keep clicking the same thing. Just one second. Bear with me. Um, okay, how's that? Perfect. Ah, oh, thank you very much. And <laughs> sorry for the uh, delayed introduction. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, you're all very welcome to this evening's webinar on AI. Now, part of my role, as Michelle uh, said, is to explore and use technology to innovate, complement, and enhance the IEP services. And following a similar presentation to my colleagues in AI earlier this year, which also focused on trends and practical applications, I was asked to put together a webinar on AI for the wider pharmacy community. Um, so. This evening, I'm delighted to be here to present an overview of AI, which I hope will give you a good understanding of its landscape, its direction of travel, and indeed some of the benefits and challenges associated with it. Okay, so on to this evening's contents. Hopefully you'll get to cover, uh, we'll get to cover this in under an hour. It will be tight. So if you have any questions, as Michelle said, please do use the chat facility and Michelle will collate and ask them in the Q&A section at the end if we have time. Uh, so here's this evening's running order. So we're going to start with uh, a little nod to the importance of AI in pharmacy, just to set the context. We'll then cover what AI is, uh, a definition, and also a brief history using a timeline, some of the AI components and applications. We'll follow that with a look at generative AI and understanding what generative AI is, 
and introduces them to chat GPT-3. And I'll follow that with a practical demonstration. So I'll use some sample use cases and we'll actually do that on the uh, OpenAI's chat GPT site. Uh, once we're done with that, uh, we'll look at some of the challenges and considerations around AI, particularly the ethical implications, data security and privacy, and of course, regulatory uh, compliance. And just before we uh, finish, we'll have a look at some future perspectives. So the direction of travel of AI and some of the implications for pharmacy practice. Uh, I'll summarize then some of the key points and then hopefully we have time for a short Q&A. So before we get into what AI is and how it evolved, uh, I wanted to take a look at some of the more well-known applications of AI in pharmacy today. I'm sure you'll already be aware of many of these applications and some of you may already be using them in your work depending on your area of uh, practice, of course. Now, AI accelerates the drug discovery process by analyzing vast data sets to identify potential drug candidates. Machine learning models predict drug target interactions, helping researchers prioritize and optimize compounds. AI also analyzes patient data to identify gen uh, genetic, environmental, and lifestyle factors influencing drug response and to tailor treatment plans based on individual patient profiles to lead to more effective and safer medication strategies, and that is uh, personalized medicines. AI tools also assist in monitoring patient adherence to medication regimes, uh, sending reminders and providing educational resources. We know that uh, improved uh, adherence leads to better health outcomes and reduced health care costs. Now, Regarding pharmacovigilance, AI helps monitor and analyze real-time data to detect adverse drug reactions and safety issues. Early identification of potential risk enhances patient safety and allows for timely regulatory interventions. AI can also optimize supply chain and inventory management by predicting demand and preventing shortages of excess stock. This could ensure a steady supply of medications and reduce the risk of disruptions. Next, we'll try and define AI, uh, look at its timeline for a very brief history, and then look at AI's core components and applications. Now, there are many, many definitions of AI out there, but I've chosen this one as it's from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I asked AI to define itself, and this is what it said. So it says that AI or artificial intelligence refers to the development of computer systems or software that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. Now, these tasks include learning, reasoning, problem solving, perception, natural language, understanding, and speech recognition. AI systems are designed to mimic human cognitive function and adapt to different situations, often improving their performance over time through learning. Now, to be clear, it's important to note that there are two main types of AI, narrow or weak AI, and general or strong AI. You need to know which is which to understand the debates around AI, and indeed news of its progress or lack thereof. So narrow AI is kind of designed to perform a specific task, such as facial recognition, which you'll have heard a lot about in the news lately, or language translation, while general AI aims to possess the ability to understand and learn and apply knowledge across a wide range of tasks, similar to human intelligence. We have achieved significant progress in narrow AI applications, but true general AI remains a goal for the future. How far out? Well, we'll see. You might ask yourself, um, is AI aware? Or could uh, you could ask, have we realized strong AI yet? I'm just going to revert to my old self now. For that last slide, I was shamelessly using AI to narrate it. Uh, best if I continue as the real me, whatever that is. I had to do that just to show how far AI has come in mimicking human speech. Not perfect, I know, but neither am I. Anyway, to a brief history of I, AI, how did we get to asking questions about whether or not computers can think? Now, please note that the timeline that I'm about to show you here is by no means the complete history of AI, nor all of the milestones in its development. 
we just wouldn't have time to do that. But I've picked out a few milestones that capture, I think, some of the more relatable events. And I wanted to show the rapid growth and acceleration of AI. So the term was first introduced by John McCarthy in 1956. Then in 1964, the first chatbot was built, which was capable of holding conversation with humans. I was surprised by that myself because it's quite a while ago. And I believe that was a conversation with a psychologist. That was very interesting, I thought. Um, in 1997, the computer Deep Blue defeated uh, Gary Kasparov, the chess player. And I think that kind of woke up a lot of people to the power of uh, computers could actually defeat a human. Uh, intelligence and all as we are. In 2002, the robotic vacuum cleaner learned to navigate independently. I think the important part here is independently. Um, the, after a while, the computer actually figured out its own route and that had done completely without human intervention. And that was a very significant step. In 2011, Siri, uh, the AI assistant was integrated into the phone, the iPhone. In 2020, just a few, a few years back, uh, chat GPT was introduced for automated conversations. And this year, what we call generative AI's breakout year. And the last mo milestone uh, breakout year is really very significant. As we will see later in this presentation, AI is now becoming mainstream, both visible and invisible. And it's well on the road to, uh, to needing a new classifications of sentience, never mind intelligence. At its highest level, AI compromises three core components, computational power, data resources, and machine learning algorithms. Now, computational power is its brain power, crunching numbers, solving problems quickly. Data resources, often referred to as big data, I'm sure you've heard that term, is like a massive library of information which, from which AI can learn or train on. And machine learning is the ability to get better with experience, like predicting what you might uh, like based on what it has learned previously your phone pinging, you ads about little blue pills, just because you are calling or uh, chatting to an IT colleague about floppy drives a while back, allegedly. So AI uses its computational power and learns from huge library and improves itself over time to assist us in various tasks, and makes things more efficient and helpful, I'm sure. So here we can see some of the subcomponents of AI and how the various strands relate to each other. For example, the machine learning component is dependent upon deep learning and predictive anal analytics, while natural language processing or NLP requires translation, classification and clustering and information extraction. Now we could go a lot deeper as this is just really scratching the surface of the many diverse and specialized functions of AI. But I think it gives a good glimpse into the depth and complexity of the ever expanding world of AI. Now here I want to show the scale of applications of AI technology across all sectors, driven by advances in processing, power, and big data. AI applications have expanded across all industries, from virtual assistants, that includes wearable AI tech, such as Humane's AI pin, to self-driving cars and many other applications. We can see a distinction between day-to-day -day applications, such as social media, chatbots, and email filtering, and other real world applications such as autonomous vehicles and heavy industry, though the lines are blurry. Next, I want to focus on one of those uh, more accessible day-to-day -day applications of AI, specifically the use of what is called generative AI or gen AI. Oops, sorry. Now, generative AI is a class of systems that can generate human-like text. It is used in chatbots, language translation systems, text summarization tools, which we will see in action later, and is used to generate original images and other multimedia content from text or vocal prompts. So you ask it to do something and it'll do it. But the yet unrealized potential is immense. Imagine if you have a collection of files in your network or computer or in the cloud. It could be a ton of PowerPoint presentations, PDFs, Word documents, Excel, Excel spreadsheets, emails, or even video recordings, and so on. Soon, you'll be able to mine all that data and extract coherent AI-generated or packaged content into new presentations, training materials, promotional materials, in multiple formats for multiple channels with simple audio and text-based prompts. You could be using prompts like this. Dear AI, 
build me a five minute training intervention on diabetes management for my patient, Mary Smith. Please include medication adherence steps and set up a daily reminder for her. Make all this available to her, to her on her phone beginning on Tuesday. Microsoft's co-pilot technology, I think, is approaching that capability. And that is something else. So let's look at generative AI and what differentiates it from non-generative AI. Now, non-generative AI is typically associated with traditional machine learning. It focuses on specific tasks and is trained to recognize patterns in existing data. It doesn't generate entirely new content, but rather makes predictions or classifications based on the patterns it has learned. On the other hand, generative AI has the ability to create entirely new content. It generates data that wasn't in its training set, but that's images or text or other content. Generative AI is much more creative and can produce novel outputs. Uh, but note the generative AI and generative AI are considered to be weak or narrow AI. As although generative AI can generate original content, it's still performing single tasks, such as responding to text prompts or responding to voice prompts. Whereas strong AI or artificial general intelligence, AGI, needs to have the full range of human capabilities, such as reasoning, talking, and even emoting. Now, two examples of non-generative AI are spam filtering and predictive text. Email spam filters use non-generative AI to identify and filter out unwanted emails based on patterns learned from labeled examples. It is also commonly used in predictive text suggestions, for example, on your phone or in Word documents, predicting the next word in a sentence based on context and the patterns from previous text inputs. You know, those annoying things when it makes you say things you didn't mean to say. Anyway, that's predictive text. So two examples of generative AI are ChatGPT and DALI. Now, ChatGPT is a powerful language model capable of generating coherent, contextually relevant text passages. This makes it highly versatile for various natural language, language processing tasks, whereas DALI creates unique images by enhancing and modifying existing ones through neural networks. Here, for example, I've used a, sing, a simple text prompt pharmacists at a webinar on AI icon style to generate this DALI 2 image. You can see the little icon there. It's got two pharmacists in a window uh, with uh, some medication. That's just created by asking it to create something very simply. Next, we'll take a close look at the generative AI application ChatGPT3. So ChatGPT is an implementation of a large language model, or LLM, developed by OpenAI. Uh, GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. It was launched last year and is based on the GPT architecture, which is the third generation or iteration of the GPT series. Series 4 is currently live, and Series 5 is on the horizon. Some believe, actually, that Series 5 will be the arrival of superintelligent AI. Now, ChatGPT has been trained on a diverse and extensive data set up until 2021. So anything after 2021, it doesn't know about. So this training uh, data consists uh, of a wide variety of sources, including websites, articles, books, and other text available on the web. Uh, ChatGPT and other uh, language module models can be used to assist in understanding complex uh, topics as a writing assistant and or creating text for various purposes, including planning or generating content or ideas. We see uh, that shortly. And in case you want to get started with it yourself, be aware that ChatGPT has free and plus or paid for versions. Free is excellent for casual use, but can sometimes be slow to respond. Hopefully it won't be this evening, uh, depending on user, and it also depends on user demand. Pro or plus versions have some additional features. It's faster, however, is currently limited to a set number of subscribers. It is based on series four of the GPT platform, which is much improved, more futurist, uh, for feature risk, rich, sorry, and more up to, and a more up-to-date resource. So it would include up to the present time. Okay, so uh, there are many ways to use chat GPT uh, to generate content, but I'm gonna use five that you might find useful. I'm gonna do this on the live site. So bear with me when I copy some pre-made prompts. Uh, so bear with me and uh, I'm just going to go to the link. 
Um, I'm going to have to do stop, stop sharing my screen for a moment and then um, reshare. Okay, just one moment. No, I'm not sure I picked the right one this time. Right, here we go. Okay, so I hope you're all seeing that. Uh, yeah. Grace, you can find that? Okay, yeah. great. So I've got some um, prompts that I've written already. Oh, I'm gonna put them into the system. You'll see what happens when I give them. So the first one I'm gonna use might be um, uh, a scenario for a pharmacist, although I would caution of using a uh, chat GPT for anything that's anything to do with the, um, your professional work, uh, but it's just a demonstration. Um, so first prompt I'll put in here, I'm gonna ask it to create a table of common OTC medications, list them alphabetically and, create, and include features, benefits and any known interactions. And let's see what happens when we send the message. Wow, see how quick that is. I'm not a pharmacist, so I can't verify the accuracy of it. That would be up to you to do that. And it does have a warning at the end. Remember that the table is generally a general guide available to response uh, and individual responses to medications can vary. Always read and follow the instructions on medication label and consult with a healthcare professional if you have any questions or concerns. And that's a salient warning. So that's one example of what you can do. And it's really not about the content per se. Uh, you know, it's to show you that it generates lists. It's very good at doing tables and it's instant. It's very, very fast. I'm going to do another one now. I'm going to actually start a new thread for this one. And this one here, I'm going to try and get it to summarize some content for me. So as I said, I'm going to start a new chat. So let's go up here. And you'll see why I do that now in a minute. I'm going to paste in my query. So I'm asking to summarize the following article on pharmacist barnet, which I found uh, in the more than 400 words. Now the article itself is 1600, so I'm hoping to reduce it by three quarters. Let's see what happens when I click that. Okay, now it's generating a summary for me. So that's gone a little more than I would like. I know I said 400 um, words. Okay, it's probably reasonable. I'm not going to read it, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow it up. Um, in the same chat window, on the same chat, I can continue my discussion. I'm not going to a new chat. I'm going to the same chat. I'm going to paste in a follow-up message. I'm going to ask it to shorten the summary to just five key sentences. And this is important because what it shows is that it has memory. It knows what it's done and it can follow up. So I'm going to ask it to shorten that summary to just five key sentences. Ah, that's more like it. Okay, so you can see uh, and ChatGPT is very good at summarizing uh, content, uh, extracting points, um, things like that. Um, okay, one more. Uh, Going to do. Ah, okay. This one's interesting. This is where you might get some uh, use, uh, some good use out of it. I'm going to go to a new chat. And for marketing purposes, I'm going to ask it to create a six week long social media campaign about smoking cessation. Let's see what it does. Hmm. I still can't get over how quickly that works. I should have said two weeks. Well, we're up to day 42. Okay, I'll just scroll back up so you can see all that. Now, I'm not going to spend time just verifying uh, the efficacy of this, but um, certainly worth uh, exploring yourselves when you get a chance. Okay, I'll do another one. Okay. 
Okay, so this, you might find this one uh, interesting. I'll go a new chat on this one. And here I'm going to ask you to come up with some video suggestions to promote a pharmacy uh, that can be used on TikTok or Instagram or spell that right, Facebook. So give me some ideas basically. Okay, so it's giving me 12. Okay, so it looks like some good stuff there. Remember, these are videos that you might create of TikTok and the like. Okay, I'll do one more and then we'll, uh, we'll return to the presentation. And I wanted to do one more that um, shows to demonstrate the, uh, uh, some of the cap uh, additional capability of ChatGPT and also have a bit of fun. So. <laughs> Uh, let's see what we make of this. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'm going to do a new chat for this one. I'm going to. I'm giving it um, a, a kind of a, a prompt engineering piece called act as. Act as means it's going to give tone and content based on what I'm asking you to act as. So in this instance, I'm saying, okay, act as a pirate and write me a scathing email to your, uh, to, well, this to my energy provider, my energy provider following overcharging in my last bill. Okay, change that. And it's important to get these things correct because you know, as the saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so let's see what it says, what it does. So it's writing me an email that I'm going to give to my provider. Okay. That's funny. Oh, hey there, you scallywags. Okay. Okay, so it's a bit of fun, but it does show you the power of uh, basically giving a uh, decent prompt or prompt engineering. You can get it to set tone and content uh, to suit. So that could be instead of a you know a pirate, it could be uh, you know uh, another profession or something else as a lawyer or whatever. It will do that for you. But I would suggest you play around it and uh, try it yourself. So I'm going to stop sharing this and go back to the presentation. And hopefully, I'll go back to the correct one. Hello, honey. Oh, hello, honey. I that's working perfect frank okay great thank you very much okay and now so you may have noticed that uh, the output uh, of the responses didn't list the sources that it was pulling the information from which is one of the kind of main weaknesses of chat gpt and other models and um, now there are some that do provide source but you typically need to pay for them or they're in beta, such as Google's new search uh, generative experience, SGE, uh, while, um, which will probably likely uh, replace the current uh, Google search application. Um, now, there is a useful link in the resources slide at the end of the presentation where you get a link to a short video on prompt engineering, and that is how to write questions for chat GPT or other uh, large learn, uh, language models that will help um, produce higher quality. But again, just to play around with them yourselves. Um, so uh, we've seen AI at work in pharmacy you know, on, and in other industries, and we've shown some examples of using generative AI, such as ChatGPT, to help with text processing and idea generation. However, AI is not without its challenges, and in this section, we'll take a brief look at some of the ethical implications, for example, concerns about inaccuracy and biases, and of course, fears around job displacement. We'll also take a look at data privacy and security concerns, and finally, some important information on regulatory compliance. So uh, this graph um, is on risk ratings. It's from the annual McKinsey Global Survey on AI usage. That's one year in uh, for employers who are using generative AI, such as ChatGPT. So one third of the survey respondents say that their organizations are using generative AI. Uh, in at least one business function. And the top five uh, AI-related risks identified were the inaccuracy of responses, and we'll get to that very shortly. 
cybersecurity, understandably, uh, IP infringement from using AI, regulatory compliance, and explainability. And explainability is uh, what is the AI source for the information that is provided. Uh, and you'll note that the workforce displacement is seventh out of the 13th risks uh, shown. Now, there's this survey here uh, shows data from uh, an RT online article uh, called, uh, uh, called One in 10 Irish People Have Used AI in Work. This is from a Deloitte uh, work survey of September this year. And it's based on a thousand Irish users in a global study of, I think it was 2,000 uh, or 28,000 uh, odd users. Um, so um, the survey kind of said that uh, over 300,000 people in, in Ireland have used artificial intelligence at work since ChatGPT launched a year ago. Uh, over 60% of people in Ireland have heard of generative AI. I think that number is going to be going up after this evening, hopefully. Um, and that over 33, uh, uh, over a third of people uh, believe that generative AI, such as ChatGPT, always produces factually accurate responses. And that's 3% uh, of global users. I find that worrying. And another 31% agree that uh, generative AI's responses are unbiased. Um, and again, that was of the global users, which again is very interesting. So we can see that some concerns around accuracy and bias, but of course there are other concerns with the use of technology, which we'll see next. Do you recognize the common, concern, uh, common concerns about the use of technology? For example, its potential to stymie critical thinking or to make users lazy or that it provides mechanisms for students to cheat. Of course, uh, I think you guessed it. Uh, the above concerns were not AI related at all, but were about the pocket calculator 50 years ago. But I think you can see lots of parallels with AI. But as we know, calculators uh, became more ubiquitous and as their advantages became evident, attitudes shifted. Uh, educators recognized that calculators could enhance learning, allowing students to explore more complex mathematical concepts and focus on problem solving rather than tedious calculations. So I guess uh, the question to ask is, um, is AI just another tool? Well, we'll see, I guess. You'll have to kind of make up your own minds after you've used it for a while, assuming that you haven't, but if you have, I'm sure you have your own opinions on it. Um, another important ethical issue is for AI accuracy. It's well known that chat GPT can sometimes give inaccurate results due to limited context understanding. You see, chat GPT processes information in chunks or of text called tokens that has a maximum token limit. This means that it might not have a complete understanding of lengthy or complex inputs. If a conversation has too many tokens, the model might lose context or miss important details. Then there's the lack of real-time information, where its training only includes data up until January 2022. If there's been significant developments or changes in the world since then, you may not be aware of them. It's also rather sensitive to input wording. That is, the model is sensitive to specific wording of the input provided by the user. A slight rephrasing of the same question might yield different responses. And if the input is ambiguous, or can be interpreted in multiple ways, or the output may not be accurate. And because of ChatGPT's generative nature, it generates responses based on patterns it has learned during its training. It doesn't have inherent understanding or consciousness. If the training data contains biases or inaccuracies, the model itself might reproduce those. Neither has it the ability to verify information. It doesn't have the capability to verify the accuracy of information it receives. So if the input contains incorrect details or assumptions, it respond, its responses might also do so. And I can't stress enough the potential dangers of using generative AI as a replacement for traditional pharmacy practice. I mean, it's fine for some admin tasks for helping with ideas for non-pharmacist-based tasks. You are the professionals, AI is not. So no matter how plausible or convincing it may seem, and to illustrate this as a warning on the, uh, on the real dangers of using generative AI in traditional pharmacist role, could still be a phenomenon of AI hallucination. So let's ask AI to explain how it hallucinates, and it really does. AI hallucination is a term that is sometimes used to describe situations where artificial intelligence systems, particularly those based on generative models like myself, 
myself produce outputs that are imaginative, creative, or nonsensical. This can happen when I generate content that goes beyond the scope of my training data, or when I fill in gaps in information in unexpected ways. Uh, I've added a very recent case on AI hallucination in the source section of the presentation from an article on nature uh, from nature called chat GPT generates fake data set to support scientific hypothesis, which you should take a look at later if you're, if you're interested. AI hallucination. Oh, yeah, it comes again. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the impact of AI and employment is a complex and often debated topic. While AI and automation will undoubtedly create new job opportunities and perhaps increase productivity, it's also leading to job displacement in certain industries and roles. This graph from Goldman Sachs Global Investment Research, March of this year, predicts automation of AI will replace the equivalent of 300 million jobs globally. Oops, sorry. However, you can see the blue, uh, light blue bars on the graph show that the majority of roles are those for which AI will complement rather than replace. Here we have listed some of the jobs that are considered more vulnerable to automation, including routine tasks in manufacturing, especially those involving assembly lines, um, anything that's susceptible to automation. Robots and automated systems can handle repetitive tasks with pre uh, precision. Jobs that involve simple data entry and processing, where the tasks are rule-based and repetitive, can be automated using algorithms. AI-powered chatbots and virtual assistants can handle routine customer queries and support tasks. This can impact jobs in call centers and customer service roles. In fact, I read recently that there was a call center in India that let go all of its workplace work workforce and replaced it with uh, AI bots and uh, call centers. Uh, with the development of autonomous vehicles, jobs related to driving, uh, such as truck driving and taxi services, may face disruption. Routine administrative tasks such as scheduling, data analysis, and basic decision making can be automated to some extent. And as for other roles, such as graphic designers, journalists, lawyers, and other sectors that are more susceptible to the threats of AI disruption, I would argue that in the medium term, anyway, many of these roles will more likely be replaced by humans with better AI skills, such as those with good prompt engineer skills or know how, rather than by AI itself. But that remains to be seen. Now, the area of security and privacy should be very familiar to all of us. Given our reliance on in the Internet of Things and the waves of online scams and phishing attempts that we experience almost daily, uh, most of the fraudulent activity is facilitated and executed by AI bots, although obviously they're not the beneficiaries. But I want to bring to your attention uh, two additional security and privacy areas that are growing rapidly and have the potential to profoundly affect wi uh, wider society and the reputation of AI itself. AI algorithms can be used to impersonate individuals or create synthetic identities. Identity theft through AI can lead to unauthorized access to personal information, financial fraud, and reputational damage. It's becoming more and more challenging to distinguish between what are genuine and synthetic content. Just this week, the journal ran a story from Press Association with the following headline, Fianna Fáil senators warn deepfakes have turbocharged the disinformation threat to elections. A bit of a mouthful, but uh, there you go. It's uh, very current. Uh, artificial intelligence can be viewed, uh, can be used to generate realistic looking news articles, blog posts, or social media content. Advanced natural language processing models like GPT-3 can generate coherent and contextually relevant text that might resemble legitimate news. So fake news generated by AI can be used to spread misinformation, manipulate public opinion, and influence political discourse. Quite sobering, is it not? So before we move on to the final section of the evening's presentation on the future perspective, let's look at the imperative of regulatory compliance, given all that we have covered around the challenges and concerns that arise from the ever increasing hold of AI. Here are some of the measures or safeguards that are being prepared to counteract the challenges we have seen. Uh, organizations that develop and deploy AI systems have ethical and legal responsibilities for the outcomes of those systems. So regulatory compliance must uh, ensure that these responsibilities are met, promoting transparency and accountability. Some regulations require that AI systems provide explanations for their decisions. 
This transparency helps build trust and ensure that individuals affected by AI decisions can understand the reasoning behind those decisions. And many AI systems uh, rely on large data sets, often containing sensitive personal information. So regulations such as GDPR in Europe or the HIPPA in the United States mandate strict controls over the collection, storage and processing of personal data. Regulatory frameworks may require AI systems to be fair and unbiased without favoring or discriminating against specific individuals or groups. This is particularly important in areas such as hiring, lending or law enforcement. Uh, regulations may require that AI systems meet safety and quality standards, especially in critical applications such as autonomous vehicles, medical diagnosis and financial services. This helps protect consumers from potential harm. Governments may regulate the export of or and use of certain AI technologies due to national security concerns. Compliance with such regulations is essential for companies involved in the development and distribution of AI. Regulations can help uh, create a level playing field for businesses by setting standards that all companies must adhere to. This prevents unfair advantages for those who might compromise ethical or legal standards. And for companies operating on a global scale, compliance with international uh, standards is crucial. Adhering to regulatory requirements uh, ensures that AI systems can be deployed and used across different jurisdictions. Compliance with the regulation helps organizations mitigate against legal risks associated with the use of AI. Failure to comply can lead to legal consequences, including fines, lawsuits, and damage to reputation. And finally, compliance with ethical and legal standards contributes to building public trust in AI systems. This is particularly important as public perception and acceptance of AI can influence its widespread adoption. Now, the pace of AI is truly astounding. We've gone from pocket calculators to generative AI in a few decades. Today, we're not so far of the next generation uh, great milestone, the AI holy grail of general artificial intelligence, which is reckoned to be about five years away. That's where AI is expected to be at least as smart as humans, if not smarter. And then there's the advent of super artificial intelligence. And to paraphrase Stephen Hawking, super arti tel uh, artificial intelligence is to mankind what man is to snails. Uh, some experts even predict that the singularity, the moment when artificial intelligence surpasses the control of humans, could happen in less than a decade, by 2031. But of course, it's not all positive. <laughs> um, we all know predicting the future is not easy. You can see my last week's data numbers, for example. And you may recall the very early days of electronic computing, when it was generally assumed that computers would expand to the size in size and complexity to the extent that there would only be a dozen or so computers worldwide and that they'd be absolutely massive in size that the only the richest countries and corporations could afford them. So you have that turned out. So predicting the future of AI is difficult and history is littered with blind alleys that science failed to visit. As Arthur C. Clarke once famously said, the more unbelievable the prediction, the more likely it is to happen. Personally, I like to draw parallels between discovery, the discovery and application of electricity to that of AI. Not long after the first light bulb went in, Mary, uh, Mary Shelley's Dr. Frankenstein gave us a frightening possibility of reanimating the dead, but instead of regenerating life, it delivered misery for the reanimated creature. Yet, electricity has undoubtedly led to great advantages in science and technology in our daily lives. However, let's not, not forget, too, that it has been used as a means for uh, for execution. Remember old Sparky, the electric chair. And so with AI, there will be lots of positive developments as well as some outlandish claims and promises and no doubt some intended cons consequences. However, however, I'm going to let AI, uh, uh, I'm going to ask AI to make five predictions for us on the direction of travel of AI. Alex is an AI generated avatar that converts text responses from chat GPT into audio output to simulate a human-like interaction. So Alex, please tell us, how may AI evolve over the next two decades? Predicting the precise evolution of AI over the next 20 years is challenging, but several trends and possibilities can be anticipated based on the current trajectory of AI research and development. Here are some potential directions in which AI may evolve over the next two decades. 
AI technologies are likely to become more integrated into your daily activities, from personalized virtual assistants to our driven healthcare diagnostics, to personalized education, and to even smarter home and home appliance systems. Progress in natural language processing, NLP, will lead to more sophisticated language models that better understand context, tone, and nuances, enabling more natural and context-aware conversations. I may become flawless in my speech and in my manner. AI applications in creative fields, including the arts, music, drama, and literature, will expand further. AI systems will contribute much more to these creative processes. This will be in collaboration with human creators, of course. The evolution of AI may involve closer collaboration between humans and machines, with AI systems augmenting human capabilities in various fields, such as creativity, decision-making, and problem-solving. Advancements in quantum computing will have a profound impact on AI, enabling faster and more efficient processing of complex algorithms. This will lead to further breakthroughs in AI capabilities. So if we extrapolate from Alex's predictions, then we can potentially look forward to an increase in AI in the work environment. To quote an American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists, ASHP, statement on use of AI in 2022, AI, AI platforms can be used to tighten inventory management, facilitate product verification, help pharmacists perform at the top of their skill set. So as AI becomes more reliable, standard pharmacy operations will become increasingly automated, allowing pharmacists to focus more on high value patient care activities. So that may mean less administrative and repetitive work and more of the good stuff like efficient clinical trials, further advances in drug development and efficacy, both linked to genetics, the use of sentiment analyzers to recognize and handle patient queries, automated patient support via dedicated pharmacy chatbots or personal assistance, automated patient monitoring and medication adherence, risk assessment and fraud reduction, as well as more data-informed patient health and proactive interventions. So what do pharmacists need to do? Well, pharmacists will be necessary in leading innovation on how AI models and technologies are developed, validated and activated to enact a change. Further, pharmacists must be poised to capitalize on the operational gains and enhanced clinical guidance made possible by AI technology to enhance patient care. To carry this out, pharmacy needs to continue to build on education that will enable current and future generations of pharmacists and pharmacy technicians to shape the evolution of AI technology. The scope and impact of changes to come will cross all aspects of pharmacy practice, requiring continued engagement by all in the field. Though this evening's presentation has a lot of information, the truth is it really is just a scrape along the surface of a fascinating subject area, which is changing day by day. So in the spirit of AI doing some light lifting, I asked ChatGPT to summarize the key points from today's evening, uh, evening into 10 takeaways. AI, one, AI is transforming pharmacy and healthcare globally. Applications include drug discovery, Discovery, personalized medicine, medication adherence, pharmacovigilance, and supply chain optimization. AI enhances patient outcomes, operational efficiency, and transform the health and transforms the health uh, landscape. Two, AI refers to computer systems emulating human intelligence. Core components include computational power, big data, and machine learning. AI's history highlights rapid growth in milestones, with generative AI now becoming mainstream. Three, generative AI like GPT-3 creates human-like text enabling applications in NLP, chatbots, and text summarization. Non-generative AI focuses on specific tasks while generative AI produces entire the new content. Examples include GPT-3 for language tasks and DALI for image generalization. Four, chat GPT can assist in understanding complex topics serve as a writing assistant and generate text for various purposes. Practical applications include generating lists, summarizing content, creating marketing copy, generating social media ideas, and writing emails. 
Five, ethical concerns include inaccuracy, biases, job displacement, and fears about AI's impact on critical thinking. Privacy and security challenges involve identity theft, deep fakes, fake news, and fraud. Job categories susceptible to automation include manufacturing, data entry, customer service, driving, and certain administrative tasks. Six, organizations must address ethical and legal responsibilities in AI development and deployment. Compliance involves transparency, data privacy, fairness, consumer protection, national security, competition dynamics, international standards, risk management, and building public trust. Seven, AI integration into daily life will increase with advancements in natural language processing. Collaboration between humans and AI will expand, especially in creative fields. Progress in quantum computing will lead to breakthroughs in AI capabilities. Eight, AI platforms and pharmacy can automate administrative tax, uh, tasks, uh, enhance clinical trials, and improve drug development. Pharmacists will play a key role in leading innovation, validating AI models, and shaping the evolution of AI technology. Nine, to capitalize on AI advancements, continuous education is crucial for pharmacists and pharmacist technicians. And 10, AI's impact will span all aspects of pharmacy practice, requiring ongoing, ongoing engagement and adaption within the field. So, um, that is the end of the presentation. So thank you all for listening. Um, thank you so much, Frank. Really appreciate it. That was a very experiential um, delivery. Um, really interesting to see it in action. Um, thank you to those who have inserted some questions in the chat box. Um, if there's any further burning questions, feel free to add them now and I'll start working through them. Um, so first of all, the recording will be sent to you by the end of the week, hopefully tomorrow, but definitely by Friday at the latest. And it's also uploaded to the website afterwards. I think some of the questions have been touched on since they've been inputted, Frank, but um, one of them was around, um, so the basis of what's given back to us, um, that information, how can we as health professionals stand over it? So you, you said, you mentioned how it, it comes from the internet um, so that there, there is the need for that human intervention and um, screening, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have to just um, be professional um, treat everything that you see and read and hear as uh, uh, that needs to be verified yourself. So no different than you do in your in your normal work. I mean, there are some applications of uh, uh, content uh, from ChatGPT and other large language models, uh, models that you can take as read to find that aren't an issue. But I would never take anything for granted or uh, and say, oh, that's factually correct. Uh, do your homework. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've touched on the hallucinations already and how it can you know, fill in the gaps and skew information. In terms of reproducible results, and you showed how in, in one chat asking several questions, it, it builds on what it's done previously. So the, there's a question here about for the purpose of literature reviews, for example, when putting in the same questions, if it learns from previous knowledge. So it seems it's that that is the case. Yeah, it's a good question. In fact, I wouldn't use uh, ChatGPT uh, 3 for that. Um, there are actually dedicated, and you'll see this, this will happen a lot in a lot of industries and sectors, there will be dedicated um, resources for uh, particular types of content. And um, literature reviews will be one of those. I can't remember offhand what it's called, but I will follow up uh, with, the, with whoever's asked that question and send them on uh, a link to that. Uh, be very specific for that kind of content. Mm -hmm. Um. What are the implications for intellectual property or copyright? Is that oh, kind of... it's a, that's a huge question, and I I do not have an answer for that. I mean, common sense would tell me that everything is 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 you know it, it, there's copyright on everything, and that includes um, uh, AI as well and the outputs from AI. And I think, uh, you know, I think there's a very healthy debate uh, globally on on this issue, and it is mm -hmm. yet to be resolved. Let's put it that way. Uh, but yeah, I, I would never take anything from it as being uh, you own it just because ChatGPT gave it to you. <laughs> Certainly not. Yeah. And Deirdre made a very valid point as to remembering that patients and service users are using these tools also and coming into the pharmacist with AI generated information um, and that you do have to register with ChatGPT, but all the tools are even more easily available. Um, so any advice around how to kind of combat that or 
um, allay fears or? Yeah, it's a good um, question. I, I think it's to know your enemy. Uh, you have to be aware of it. Uh, and I think mm. tonight's presentation covers some of those areas. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, you, you can get ChatGPT now on, on, a, on an app on your phone. So people will use it and people will have those tools. And, you know, not everybody be a, will be aware of the risks involved. And they will take it as gospel, the information that they get. So I guess it's down to you to educate your your your, um, your patients as you would normally do anyway. Uh, but if you're if you're aware of the issues, then you will be easier for you to uh, to talk through them with your with your patients. Yeah, very true. Um, kind of linked to that one is the question: Do you know are there any pharmacy specific applications for Ireland in de in development at the moment? So maybe specific to the Irish system or anything. Uh, and not that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean there aren't. I mean, the AI the pace of of of, of uh, development and rollout uh, within AI is, is absolutely astounding. I mean, every, every day I'm getting alerts about new applications and new things being rolled out, and that's in Ireland and globally. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there are, but I don't have any visibility now at the moment. But I'm sure with a little research, I could find that out. No problem. And um, just um, somebody said worth considering the environmental cost of AI and the energy required and um, definitely something to consider. Um, so is there a risk of web pages themselves being generated by AI, meaning even trying to validate content generated by AI risks being undermined? Yeah, absolutely. Everything. Uh, I mean, mm. everything that is uh, generated from AI has to be treated with uh, uh, caution um, and yeah people have used it to build websites they've used it to do all kinds of things I mean you saw earlier the bits about uh, you know fake website fake news all of that stuff there I mean in, the, in terms of phishing and scamming you know people getting links out to what purport to be genuine bank websites we're asking people to put in their passwords they think they're on their home or they're on their they're at their bank and they're not they've just clicked a link to a site that looks exactly the same they don't know any mm. difference so that's a good example of, of uh, where you know false uh, websites uh, are used or generally yeah. used for nefarious purposes yeah um we could be here all night talk about this there's lots of thanks and excellent information um people are fascinated by frank just um pat has asked how happy is frank with the ai summary of his presentation how well does it correlate with what he would have said himself <laughs> Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I probably about 90 percent. Uh, I missed a couple of things and it emphasised some some other things. But I think generally, um, given uh, the concision of the time I had to do it, uh, I thought as an exercise, uh, it kind of it's walking the walk. It's walking the walk rather than talking the talk. Uh, and I think I let you judge uh, for yourselves on your thing. But I, I was generally happy with it. Great. And yeah, I think on that note, we'll, we'll leave it. Listen, Frank, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and time. It's been really insightful and lots of food for thought, I think, for us going back to our own respective sectors. Um, thanks a million. Much appreciated. And thank you all for attending. Um, thank you. There is a survey going into the chat box. We'd really appreciate that feedback um, in that format if you have an opportunity. Um, so feel free to click on that. And it's the time of year to be thinking about CPD. So um, whether you've been called or you're you know, ultimately going to be called for your e-portfolio in the coming year or two, um, it's a great opportunity. The fact you've given the time to this event, just take the, that extra few minutes to generate that cycle and reflect on your practice. Thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, our final webinar before Christmas is next is on Wednesday, the 13th of December at 8 p.m., so two weeks' time. That's on the non-specific signs of cancer and our friends at the National Cancer Control Programme who have presented to, for us previously will be back with us for that. The invitations will be sent by email and remember to keep an eye out on the IORP social media for updates. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Joe. Good evening. See you.